Um, I want to pick up on uh, something about uh, Freud not resolving particular issues, and, and that that's that's a common uh, practice, especially in the 19th century and uh, a great part of the 20th century. And um, uh, Karen Nami. So it can, and it's constantly balancing itself. Okay, uh, and that, in, in, and of course, that's the big question in that novel. Well, what is what's, what does the Moby Dick stand for? The white whale stand for is the big question. Okay. Blank white, nothing, the unknowable, mm -hmm. inexplicable. Mm -hmm. It's white, you know. It's white. It's all colors and everything else. And um, anyone who attempts to try to define what it is. Um, suffers from myopia, okay? this single vision of things. Make, uh, making a resolution, a resolution or a synthesis and saying, that's what it is right there. And so Ahab gets wiped out, okay? And uh, uh, virtually everyone except Ishmael, okay? Who um, has to live to tell the story that he's, he's found floating in a coffin. That's his boat, okay? The only person who really seems to understand what's going on is Pip, D-I-P. Who is the cabin boy who falls overboard, okay, and goes down and comes up again, and they pull him back on the ship, and he he can say one thing. He 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 can do one thing. He conjugates the verb to see. I see. You see. He sees. She sees. It sees. We see. You see. They see. And he goes back to the top. And it becomes a parable. Because everyone aboard that ship is trying to figure out what the world something is. And I forget the character, but it maybe it's Ahab or somebody, it's probably somebody else, nails up this, this basically this doubloon okay, with an image on it. And each person has a very different interpretation of what it means. Okay. But singularly, okay, separate from the others, okay, 
and um, and that see, they see that as the truth, the truth of the matter. Forgetting that we see in different ways, but that needs to be extended because it has to be the way the whale sees. This way, this way. Yes, no, yeah, whatever the issue is, when you're studying an object. Then we finally get to the point of someone like um, Elkins writing a book, The Object Stares Back. So it's about subject-object relationships. The subject, the author, is in control of the object, is going to study. That's science. That's modernism. But the object begins to rebel in a sense. Well, what is it? Baudrillard has it as a sharp piece, um, the revenge of the object. Is that right? Re revenge of the object? Do you know this? Oh, no, the revenge of the crystal, okay, which is an object. And he talks about how objects, you know, revolt against us as well. So they're all, so, so this idea of the parallax view then is really instructive. And allowing us to see how people were thinking in the 19th and 20th century as a result of the failure of, of, of uh, science. That is the domination of objects, okay? And because why is this so important for us to understand this? Because people were making moral judgments saying Freud did not make a decision about whether or not these children were raped or had the fantasy of Now, that's one example, and that's a, one that is loaded okay, with all kinds of um, possibilities of misfiring and backfiring and so on. So you find it in um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, you find it in Emily Dickinson, you, they're all working with this, with this issue as well. Do you have any questions or thoughts? I just um, was going to say that I just finished a 700 page book that says why Freud was wrong by um, Richard Webster mm -hmm. and um, I, it kind of states that he and this is a very small mm -hmm. of 700 pages, sure. yeah. but um, he kind of states that he forces or hypnotizes or, and you know what um, he was on when he was writing his stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, it's, it's just another take on, um, and it was written in this century. So. Mm -hmm. Masson, um, Masson has a book, it's very famous, The Estate. <coughs> The assault uh, on truth, and, and he, he's, he basically says that this is a really interesting story. He, he was the person who was in charge of the archives. You know, Anna was going to let him be in charge of the archives, and then he does this thing. He attacks Freud, saying that basically Freud knew what the truth was and he lied, he absolutely lied. Okay. Who's this? Uh, Masson, M A S S O N. I refer to it as a Masonic. Uh, Masonic. Um, something like that. I what the word is. Interesting. Uh, and so I, you know, I've talked to Avatar Rennell here and so on, and, and a bunch of other people. Uh, and um, she um, is very much in this exact work. But uh, what's interesting is that in the book, Masson is trying to break away from, I mean, it's so easy to read in Freudian terms, you know, which is sort of unfair. But, but yeah, um, Freud was mistaken. We all are. Human. Yeah. We are all mistaken. If I say something, you can mistake what I've said. Uh, so it's really not, I'm not the author you know, of that. So you could, you, I could say things that could be easily taken to, you know, to be the worst sorts of things. And Elliot says, that was not it at all. That was yeah. not what I meant mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. That's right. In uh, Prufrock's um, indecision and hesitancy, and um, what's the name of this song? Um, Love song of J. Alfred yeah. Prufrock. Yeah, I'm sorry. What's the, the name of this? The title of this seminar? I didn't give it that title. Hesitating thoughts. Yes. 
Um, turn to page, uh, well, if you have the book, page 73, or I'll read to you what's there. You have to really get into the book. On page, um, let's see, let's see. Uh, it's right here. Top, uh, uh, it's uh, JFL speaking. What we have said so far is a little uncertain, discontinuous, somewhat meticulous, but in the pejorative meaning of the term, a, a um, little obsessive. Also, and I have the same feeling you do. I think it comes from the fact that I am myself hesitant. To simplify, I hesitate between two positions, while still hoping that my hesitation is vain and that these are not two positions. To put it quickly, between a pagan position in the sense of a sophist, in a position that is, let us say, Kantian. And at times he may somewhat, for a moment, in a scandalous moment, synthesize those two and say, what is he hesitating about saying? The Kantian sense. Now, let me interject this. The, the term sophist is meaningless, historically. Etymologically, uh, it, it generally means a wise person, okay? Uh, and it's been applied to so many different people, like Christ. Lucian referred to Christ, that man who, who uh, you know, hung on, was uh, uh, nailed to the cross, that sought that great sophist. Not calling him Christ, but I mean, this is, you know, in, in the context, it's clear that this is what he referred to. Uh, so, um, Socrates was called a sophist and so on. Okay. Uh, so it's a very common. Term, but Plato turns it into a, a, a devil term. Okay. Uh, in the dialogue, the sophist, which is alluded to in the opening section of this book. Okay. Let's look at the table of contents. Quickly, the possible consensus, the impossible consensus, the three pragmatic positions. <coughs> A general literature, a casuistry of the imagination, a politics of judgment, the faculty of political ideas. Majority does not mean great number, but great fear. And then Sam Weber's son, uh, afterward, which is really, really a good, good uh, comment. Sam will be here later. Uh, I'll be gone by the time he uh, gets here. He's one of the last. Uh, how do you read these words? How do they fit together? What do they suggest to you? Do you spend much time reading and studying uh, tables of contents? It's very, they're, they're, sometimes they're almost mindless, and you wonder why why were these chosen? You know, no matter how long you stare at them, but at least that's my experience. Other times, I mean, they're incredibly telling. I have written, uh, I'm writing a number of of um, articles, brief articles now that are uh, about tables of contents. And the one I started with was um, Giorgio Gambin's um, coming uh, community. It just, it worked. And I showed it to him, I had it written, and it just, you know, I can say this. I really blew his mind, because I haven't seen anything like this before. This is really good. So when he said that, I thought, well, maybe I'll turn this into a book and do it a baker's dozen of them, okay? And it's how to read, the title might be, How to Read a Table of Contents. Okay? And it could do the same for an index. There are some really interesting indices out there, but, but for the most part, they're crap. So, um, so what are your thoughts about it? What's, what's happening? What, what happens? What are the words that stick out? Casuistry. Casuistry. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Uh, compl a complexity of language that becomes over ornate or impossible. It's like the secret. Thing. Is a way of camouflaging the truth. Yeah. It's a negative term and it's often assigned to the Jesuits. Exactly. Um, taking a story and changing it and making it into something else. The person who talks about it, I think, really successfully and productively is Kenneth Burke in Attitudes Towards History. He has um, 
he has a, a way of um, writing books that have sections like glossaries, I don't know what they mean, something like that, where he takes <laughs> words and, and reanimates them in some way. But you know, Deleuze does that all the time. He uses old um, philosophical terms associated with metaphysics and totally re-describes them, as if he's rehabilitating these terms. It's really interesting. And, and, and any, so anyone new, you know, is a little bit of a background in philosophy, starts picking up and reading and say, God, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not doing the party line. Um, and, and what he says, what Burke says, is that a, he uses the phrase casuistic stretching, where you take someone's thought and you reshape it to mean a little something else which we all do automatically anyway. Edward Said and talks about traveling theories where you'll get someone's theory and you'll add your bit to it. And, and it's like, you know, history, what is it? Um, I tell you a story, you tell that person, it changes, and she changes it, she changes it. And add, you add something onto it, which is figured in in this book, yeah. Yeah, in terms of the, uh, the tribe of, of the storytelling. But um, so you, you take something and you and you announce that you're casuistically stretching it to make something new. So there is n therefore there would be no authoritarian statement about it because every every statement would be a misstatement. 